Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be back in Thailand, and it's an honor to be here to speak with you about how trustworthy generative AI can change your business. Um, I think I know everyone's been talking about ChatGPT, so I'll touch on it very briefly. I'll try not to be uh, dwelling on that too much. It's a very popular tool out there. It generates very interesting conversational texts, and then, but the bigger part of it is it brought into focus the power of AI and allowed the general public to experience it. Now, over the last six months, a lot has happened. First, generative AI and ChatGPT and AI will save the world, usher in a whole new era of creativities and um, productivity and inventiveness. Six months on, narrative is changing. Back in June, some 500 companies and some of the biggest AI leaders and some of the largest companies in the world signed a 23 words letter saying that doomsday is coming. AI is going to end humanity. Now, I don't actually believe that, and in fact, many people don't believe that at all. In fact, recently in Nature magazine, there was a really interesting editorial that talks about this particular narrative. Some of the largest AI company in the world is telling us AI is going to end the world. That, in the article, the author says, is self-serving, because many ethicists says that actually is the fuel that drives the AI arm race. When you tell the world that the technology that you own is going to end the world, then the world is going to come to you and say, "Help me protect." Is that whole? Perpetuating thing that happens at IBM, we don't believe technology, AI technology, is going to end the world. It is absolutely going to change the world. Agnes mentioned a number of technology um, invention that were inflection point: cloud computing, mobile technology. Um, uh, quantum will definitely be doing that in the future. And right now, it's AI's turns. I'm going to use another example of how, of how technology can change the world. Um, may, but maybe going a little bit further back. Uh, the year is 1440, so quite a while back. In Germany, Johannes um, Gutenberg invented the Gutenberg printing press. Fantastic piece of technology. Many, many people wanted to ban it. Many people who own knowledge, the ones that were writing and printing scriptures, scientific texts. They hated the fact that the printing press would democratize knowledge to the general public. The fact that it turns the printing process from by hand about 40 pages a day to 3,600 pages in a single day. It allows us to spread that information that much better. Now, was that technology dangerous? A little bit. I mean, there's a lot of propaganda that's been printed using the printing press. But I think we can all agree the overall positive impact when that technology is used ethically, with transparency, with accountability, is so powerful. Without it, we're not going to be here today. Without the printing press, if they were successful in banning and destroying the technology, what would happen today? We're definitely not sitting here talking about AI changing the world. We're probably trying to invent the light bulb right now. That will set us back hundreds of years. So we don't believe in that narrative at all. We believe, though, that we need to get together and have that conversation, co-create, and deliver trustworthy, ethical AIs. In fact, IBM AI Ethics, and I, I have quite a bit of knowledge around that space because I happen to sit in the ethics board as a, as a focal point in APAC. Um, there's three guiding principles. Number one, AI should be used to make us work better and make our life better, and it should touch many rather than just the elite. Number two, at IBM, we truly believe that the data and the insight 100% belongs to the creators. We will never use your data to do anything that's not permitted by you. In fact, we will not use the data to build models, for example. And then finally, we believe that AI technologies need to be transparent, and we need to use that responsibly. Those are the guiding principles that we use for 
uh, building any AI solution. So with that in mind, we're going to get a little bit into what we are doing in generative AI and uh, how we're leveraging the technology and what we're doing with our customer and our partners to co-create solution. Now, ChatGPT is great, but it's one model. I mean, maybe there's a couple models underneath it and a, a little bit of extra uh, smoke and mirror to make it work perfectly. It's a great piece of technology, but that's just the beginning. The bigger picture is foundation models. Foundation models can do more than just language. You know, they have already demonstrated that DALI 2, for example, can generate pictures based on words. So there's already more than one foundation model that's famous out there. Uh, we believe that foundation models can really change business, and that's where the big picture comes in. So a quick word on foundation models, if you're not familiar. Um, main difference between traditional machine learning model versus foundation models is that well, traditional machine learning and AI model, you basically take a bare model and you have to train it from scratch. This is traditional machine learning, so it takes a little bit less maybe data point to actually get the training done. But I would say that uh, that's still quite laborious and quite challenging. Now, foundation models, on the other hand, takes even more data to train. But it's pre-trained before we deliver it to you. So from that perspective, um, there's already a foundation set of learning. The way to use foundation model is to then add your own data to fine tune it to perform the task that you want it to perform. So that's what the foundation model does for you. A point of clarification, before we get too excited about generative AI and start forgetting about traditional AI, I'm going to draw that distinction here. Generative AI as it exists today is not going to replace the traditional AI that we know and love. Regression models are still going to be there. Churn analysis, cluster analysis is still going to be there, and it's going to play a crucial part to your business's success. So I know that all the hype is generative AI, but the reality is you need both. The analogy is very simple, I would say. Um, traditional AI has been good at mimicking humans' analytical power. Our, a way of reasoning and thinking through, the way we do math. That's what, that's what analytical AI, uh, uh, traditional AI does. It predicts the future as well. It's actually very good at doing prediction. Generative AI, on the other hand, I would say, is that complementary part of our brain, the creativity aspect. Now, we all know you cannot, you know, we can exist with just one or the other. We need to actually have both sides of our brain working together to be at our best. AI is the same, absolutely the same. So keep in mind, we're not replacing traditional AI with generative AI. So let me use an example as to how we're co-creating with that two side uh, of the AI brain, if you will. Uh, first example, really quick, um, golf tournament. Lots of golf being played here in Thailand, I know that. Um, so this is our partnership. We actually worked together with the organizer of the Masters Golf Championship earlier this year. Now, this is prior to Watson X launch, so we didn't actually use that as a Watson X event. Uh, but we basically got together and said, hey, how are we going to engage the viewer of the Masters Golf Championship better? So in April, the latest running of that particular championship, we created a solution IBM Consulting and the actual Master Golf team actually came together and said, let's use generative AI to provide AI commentary to all the video clip. All 20,000 video clips generated during that one weekend, we use AI to generate commentary with only a 20-second delay. So the clip would come in, we would generate the actual commentary. Anyone using the mobile app to view the, the actual championship can see each hole with commentary alongside it, explaining the game. Second aspect, we marry that with something that we've always done in the past with the golf championship, which is to analyze the performance of the player based on tr using traditional machine learning, to predict how they're going to do in each of the hole, so that we can use the two pieces of information to drive deeper excitement and deeper engagement with the actual viewer. Then we repeated it again a little bit later. So that was it back in April. Now this is, I think, beginning of July, I believe, is the Wimbledon. So once you've done the biggest golf championship, what do we do? Well, we're going to run off and use the second use case and do the biggest tennis championship, arguably. Um, so the Wimbledon, 
earlier uh, in July, we basically did the same thing with them. So why am I bringing this up? Why am I using two example? Part one, first point. I remember foundation model is a foundation that you can retrain and customize to do new things. Well, we have a model that knows how to speak sports. We trained it to speak golf, and then a couple months later, we fine-tuned it to speak tennis. So the tennis championship foundation model work is based on the same foundation model that we were using to generate that piece of, of information. Second thing, again, we used our blueprint because when you have success, let's make sure we repeat it. We used a blueprint and actually did an AI draw analysis. So there's this um, power draw analysis that the Wimbledon team and the IBM, IBM consulting team does together. Effectively, what they try to do is model the performance of each player and then they put them against each other and match up on that particular day, that particular condition, who's going to win. Really, really interesting piece to highlight the importance of analytical brain and creativities together. Okay? Um, when they did the analysis in terms of sentiment, so using large language models, using NLU to analyze who's going to win in the final, was it Novak or was it Carlos? By a large margin, the general public says, Novak's definitely going to win this tournament. But the math didn't say that. So when they actually did the analysis, they basically pitted the two players against each other for a 100 match on that particular day. The analysis says 55 out of 100 times, Carlos is going to win, based on current condition, based on current fitness level performance in recent months. And only 45 out of 100 would Novak be actually be the winner. Now, if you actually go look online, John. Uh, John McEnroe actually made fun of our AI prediction, said that you guys are way off IBM. No idea what you guys are talking about. But guess who won? Carlos actually won. So you can't just say generative AI or the other. Both are important. They're both skills that we have as human beings, and they're both skills that AI needs in order to drive a stronger outcome. So, Big conclusion here is we don't believe a single model is going to rule them all. We believe you need to have a number of different skills in your toolbox in order to build AI for business. Just a quick example of other AI foundation models that we're working on. Everyone's talking about large language models and natural language processing, maybe a little bit of video and image generation, but there's so much more to it when you want to solve serious problems. Partnership announced back in February, again, before we did anything with WasanX or anything like that, we had a research, part research partnership uh, with NASA. We're going to build a very big, large foundation model, uh, 300,000 scientific pieces of scientific literature being put together into a single large language model to have Q&A with uh, research scientists trying to fix climate change. Now, interesting and imp important part, this is what I would consider to be a closed domain generative AI solution. What do I mean by that? Closed domain means I need to have pure information in a very narrow part of the general knowledge space. So only climate change research, only the 300,000 articles. Versus in the consumer space, you're going to see a lot of generative AI and conversational AI around the open domain can talk about anything. Now, being very honest here, the open domain AIs are really big. They're trillion parameters models because there's so much knowledge out there around general stuff. So those models are actually very, very powerful. The problem is those models don't always know the truth. Tends to have hallucination, tells you the wrong thing. Um, when I use an analogy, when I describe the two things, Closed domain AI is when I sit there and I'm, I'm sitting there with a colleague in the uh, scientific research community and we're going to have a, a conversation and an argument around climate change. You know, this is a guy with a PhD, I believe what he's going to say. Open domain AI is your best friend that you go drinking with. You sit out there and you have a chat and you can have a chat about just about anything. I mean, he's personable, he's amazing at doing it, but 20% of the time he's wrong. You cannot afford to be wrong. 
And I'm going to put this out there for you guys. Almost every business-related problem when it comes to large language is a closed domain problem. I do not see any business that needs an open domain AI running their chatbot. If you're going to want a virtual assistant, do not think about an open domain one. You only care about the information that you want to present, nothing else. And that's where we kind of come in. We think in business sense. That's what IBM wants to do. Other things that we are doing, uh, using geospatial information to build model to predict what the world may look like if a climate change event were to happen. So another important use case. But again, there are many, many skills that you're going to need. So this is where a big picture of the different skills that we think business is going to need. Large language models at the bottom there. Customer cares is a typical use case, and then code generation is a second one. But that's not all of it. We've been doing research around all the other areas, including, did I touch the, no, that wasn't me. Um, We've been doing different things around sustainability, understanding, um, well, actually, I, I, I went and saw a piece of research in Boston, in the MIT lab, where IBM is working with a company to come up with a better mix of materials that is greener to produce. New formulas, new molecule, how to create concrete that has a lower CO2 footprint. Foundation model for scientific discovery that gives you better outcome saving the planet a little bit more. So there's a whole lot of examples that we can go into around that. IT operations, saving electricity, preventing outage, all that. Um, so that's a whole host of things that we can do with foundation model. What do we provide? Well, when you use foundation model, you really need the ability to try the model, to fine tune it, perhaps to do some parameter tuning, so add some more uh, nodes into the neural network, if you will. And then eventually, you want to be able to deploy and monitor. And you want to be able to do that in scales. Because again, I, I need more than one skill to be a successful AI for business. You know, virtual assistants that only answer question, eh, it's OK. But if we can actually transact, make transaction for you, look up balance for you as well, different skill set. If it can tell you uh, what the stock price might be tomorrow using some predictive analysis, some time series analysis. That's another skill. So you need all these skills, and you need these skills to be deployable on an enterprise platform. And that's where Watson X comes in. So you heard quite a bit about Watson X, probably saw all the logo. This is our next generation uh, AI platform for building trustworthy AI for business. The tagline, putting AI to work. Again, we want to make sure that we can work smarter as individuals. Uh, when we, we interact with AI from a day-to-day -day basis. So we want to make sure that we can put AI to work. Now, the Wimbledon use case, since we've been launched, we actually said that that's actually a Watson X use case. We are using foundation model, we are using traditional model, and we are actually going to manage that using Watson X uh, as the basic platform. Now, as an AI for the, and data platform, Watson X can be uh, considered in three main components. Watsonx.ai, Watsonx.data, and Watsonx.governance. Those are the key uh, three main components that we're bringing to market, and they all serve a very specific purpose. Number one, Watsonx.ai. This is where you actually train, validate, deploy, and monitor your, your machine learning model. Watsonx.data goes maybe perhaps one layer deeper, said, well, we know that there's really no good AI and trustworthy AI unless we have the data that we need. The data that's underneath must be trusted, must be delivered in an agile manner, and you must be able to use different types of data regardless of where it resides. So we created this platform to help scale AI so that you can send your AI workload to anywhere on your hyper cloud environment. So that's what Watsonx.data is all about. Now, you have data, now you have AI. Last components of building trustworthy AI, of course, is governance. So you want to provide safeguard and guardrails and processes to help build better AI. And again, that's the end-to-end -end, um, ML ops solution that we would like to present to you as the governance layer. That's under uh, wasnx.governance today. Now, I, I will 
quickly pause here for a second and let you know that Watson X dot AI is currently available. Watson X dot X dot data is currently available, and Watson X dot governance will be coming in about a month and a half, two months' time, we hope. So just to, to set that straight before I, I forget that part. Um, but inside Watson X is also interesting. This is kind of how they generally work together. The lower half says Watson X dot AI will leverage the data from Watson X data to actually build AI models and AI solution. And then the governance will allow you to actually handle everything necessary there. But at the same time, um, Watson X dot data internally uses Watson X dot AI technology. So we are using generative AI technology, for example, to generate um, uh, description for the data that you have in your databases. It would, for, in Watson X data, we would, we can actually automatically scan the data inside your database, and then based on what we find, we can generate a description to help you document the data that you have, so that you actually, your user will have a better understanding of it. And we're doing that using the same gender AI models that you see elsewhere. Um, we're also doing a lot of things around Watson Assistance and Watson Discovery, Cognos. Almost all our product will begin to, you, you begin to see more and more AI infusion. Just like SAP is using our AI technology in the, AI, in the SAP cloud, you guys are not going to be the first to use Watson X.AI technology. We've been using it for the last two years, building AI solution, AI ops, Cognos Analytics, all those products that you probably have seen that had a natural language interface, we have actually converted all the natural language processing to Watson X models. Next up, I'm going to actually showcase a little bit in terms of what Watson X.AI can do. Now, you asked me what is it, what, what is it that we're actually shipping? Well, we're actually shipping quite a few um, different components. Key things, these are some of the key tasks that Watson X.AI is going to help you accomplish when it comes to the generative AI side. Right? It will help you with summarization, with classification, with content generation, entity extraction, as well as general Q&A. This is capabilities that will be included in Watson X.AI through a number of foundation models that we're going to include. We're only going to leave the door with LLM models, but over time, you're going to see more and more of proprietary models from IBM as well as open source models being added to the platform to increase the capabilities, to give the platform more skills. That's what we're going to do uh, as, we go, as we go through. Now, in this environment, you can actually manage the fine-tuning of your foundation model and, and, and your large language model on one side, but at the same time, it's also the same platform where you would manage the traditional machine learning models as well. A single platform for all your skills. If you want to imagine that artificial intelligence is mimicking a human brain, if you will, we can probably argue that that's what it is, and, and some will argue we, we're now into the super intelligence space where, where we can be, so, you know, AI is going to be smarter. But if you imagine that's what it is, then Watson X.AI is the platform, single platform, that's the left brain and the right brain. You have the ability to build, fine tune, and use generative AI models. You also have the ability on the other side, I think that's the left brain, to do all the analytical ca calculation that you're used to doing. So your regression analysis, your, dimension, your dimensionality reduction, your clustering, your random forest, they sit on the same platform. So what's an X.AI is going to be your brain, if you will. And then we can continue to do analogy. I see Agnes smiling. <laughs> I like to think that what's an X.AI and the what's an X platform eventually become the brain of every company and every organization in, in Thailand. That would be, that would be my, my big goal. I think Suravit would really love that. Um, so I already mentioned a little bit about this part, so I'm going to jump a little bit into what Watson X.AI will help you do today. Uh, first, when you're using generative AI and large language models, there are a few no ideas that, that's important. Um, first, the concept of prompt. A prompt is any input that you give a generative AI model to, uh, to, to cause it to generate an outcome. So in most cases, you know, or chat GPT or otherwise, you type a question or you type a statement and you, you provide a command. 
That's a prompt. Now, uh, when you say zero-shot prompting is when you take the model out of the box and you ask it a question and you say, what is it going to do? You, know, you ask it a question and see what it does. Uh, and foundation model will be able to provide an answer. You know, traditional AI machine, it won't know anything unless you train it. In this case, it will be able to answer a question. But it may not be all that accurate. And I was actually playing around with some of the models that we provided. And I, I asked, and by the way, we, we, I think we provided eight or 10 different models by the time uh, a product really rolled into to full production in just large language. Uh, I asked a, a simple question. I asked, what is the capital of Canada? It's funny because depending on which model I ask the questions, the answer is different. Sometimes one of them says it's Canada. I'm like, capital of Canada. Oh, by the way, I'm Canadian, in case you're wondering. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the capital of Canada is not Canada. One of them actually answered Canada. Another one answered Montreal. And then the third one answered something else. Lots of language models can hallucinate. On what's the next platform, the model that we provide all has parameter that allows you to, con to control the lucidity of that model. How lucid is that model going to be? If it doesn't know, it should tell you, I don't know. It shouldn't just make up an answer like Montreal, which one of the model did. But you could actually, on the platform, change the, the, the parameter to say, hey, I, I don't want you to make up an answer unless you are 95% certain or more, so that it doesn't give you the wrong answer. It gives you the answer, I don't know, rather than an answer that's incorrect. So that's one thing that you can do there. The other thing that, that's important here is you can start doing Tuning. So few shot uh, prompting is when you actually provide some examples to the model so that it can do the task better. And you can do that in a very simple no-code user interface inside whatsonext.ai. So any business user can go and do that. Next up, data-driven tuning. Few shot, tuning is, few shot uh, prompting tuning is great for you know, single experimental use cases when you're evaluating. But when you're actually going to deploy that platform, when you're actually going to use that model, you're going to want to enhance the model with perhaps a few thousand training data points. And all of those capabilities will be provided on a single platform, and you can manage all of it as pipelines. Not, by the way, don't get me wrong, you can do that today in the open source by writing code. You can go into a Python notebook and you start typing away and you can do that. Now we all know in the enterprise space, when you just write code in a notebook and then you save it, that knowledge lives as long as that person works for the organization. And that's why you want to start building processes and pipeline. You need ML ops to be in play. And that's what WatsonX is about. Consistent output and consistency in delivery. Uh, I I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. Now, I mentioned that there's going to be a number of different large language foundation models. IBM, I think, is providing five, four or five different ones. And then we have already selected four um, from Hugging Face that are open source models. By the way, some of the best LLM models are actually in the open source. So this is why we have a partnership to include them. Um, those models are there so you can choose. In the tools, you can actually through a single Dropbox, select a different model and try the same prompt and see which one does the best job. And you can do that in seconds. You can experiment with all the models that we provide to see which one does better. Now, you may ask me, Kitman, so why don't I just pick one? Why, why do you give me five or six? Well, here's the thing. Depending on the task, the model will be more or less suited. For example, a very sophisticated model generates better and more um, convincing text. So large, a lot of parameters, 20, 30, 40 billion parameters models, will be much better at generating human-like text. But it also is more prone to hallucination, and it's harder to fix, or it's harder to fine-tune the hallucination out when it's more, more parameter points in it. It costs more to compute to do that. So depending on the task, you may choose to use a less parameter models. So you see there, uh, there's some models that we provide are 20 per billion parameters. Some of them are only 153 million. They're all used for different things. So you can choose the right model for your needs. And everything is fully documented so that we help you choose and we help you deploy. IBM also shipped a bunch of models and about 
a bunch of, a bunch of them is actually in, in the actual uh, uh, product itself. And I will tell you that they, these are not meant to be the most sophisticated mo uh, model you see. They're meant to be sophisticated for business, and they're trained for that purpose. Why would you want to use them, you ask? Well, very simple. There are some cases where it's critical that the information you provide is 100% correct and never have anything hateful comes out, never have any IP indemn indemnity issues. That is where our model comes in. We train our model with the IBM data pile. The IBM data pile has been vetted for hateful speeches to make sure that there's nothing wrong with the, the stuff that we use to train the AI. It's been um, looked after by our legal team to make sure that there are no copyright issues associated with it. So when you modify one of the IBM provided proprietary models, you are assured of the lineage of that model from algorithm to data to how it arrives at your doorstep for your use. There's a set of use cases where this is extremely valuable. And then you can also do a lot of open source integration through our partnership with Hugging Face, and they have tens of thousands of models available for your use. Um, it's already telling me that my time is up. I tend to do that a lot. So this is Watsonx.ai. It's there to help you innovate with generative AI as well as traditional machine learning, skill set together. It's, your brain, it's the brain of your operation, if you will. Uh, Orwan is going to talk a little bit about um, what's an X dot uh, data, and I think in the next session. And uh, very soon you'll hear a whole lot more about where our governance base is coming from when we launch that part of the, the Watson X platform. With that, I'm going to bid you farewell for now, and hopefully I'll see you uh, at the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you.